It's the end of what has been a very interesting, informative, and really quite a fun day. Spent at Nintronics, the excellent hi-fi and AV dealership based in Hertfordshire, and they have been hosting Kef. Kef have been here presenting their brand new Reference and Blade Meta speakers. And Kef's Dr. Jack Oakley Brown was here giving a technical presentation and I was able to get it all on camera because there's a lot of interesting technical advancements and improvements with the new reference and blade meta speakers that you really can't see. It's all improvements that are inside the speaker and with the speaker or really the UniQ driver. And I learned a hell of a lot from the presentation today from Dr. Jack Oakley Brown. I want to say a huge thank you to him for coming here and obviously allowing me to film it. And I need to say a huge thank you to Nintronics for, again, allowing me to come here and film it and yeah, for hosting such a day. Got to meet a lot of you and a lot of other very like-minded audiophiles. We've all had a great day and you know what? <laughs> I'm really tired. So yeah, let's just get on with the presentation. I hope you enjoy it. If you do, smash that thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you soon. Take care. The majority of the story of these two speaker ranges is about that, which is the new UniQ driver. Blade was originally launched in 2011, I think. Sounds about right, Nick. And then the reference series range was uh, launched in 2014. So um, in, in terms of driver technology for us, that's quite a long time ago now. We have quite a lot of uh, innovative technology that we've developed since. Um, and so this was a chance not really, you know, just to put the meta material into the new UniQ, but also to revamp the entire driver. So this driver that we have now in both ranges is pretty much completely new. Uh, there's one or two pieces in here which are shared with the driver that was in the, the older blade and the older reference series. So although, you know, the meta material takes a headline, there's actually quite a lot of other things that have gone into this. Uh, and at the same time as that, you know, putting a new driver into a system, you always have to rework the crossover afterwards anyway. And so knowing these systems backwards, as we do, when we're developing this driver, we're also keeping an eye on how we could change this driver in order to make the crossover work better. A quick intro maybe to Blade and Reference for those who aren't as familiar with KEF speakers. But these are our flagship series of loudspeakers. We've been making a a series called The Reference in Maidstone since about 1974. It's always been our you know, flagship series. It represents the best technology that we have. Uh, the, the blade is, is slightly different because it's more of a technology statement piece, but we manufacture it in exactly the same way as our reference series products. So these are still assembled in, in Maidstone in the UK. Uh, the way that we um, assemble them is uh, quite different from a lot of our other speakers. They're made in pairs. So a left and right pair is built by one technician who will assemble it from start to finish. And they're totally responsible then for every aspect of the assembly. So it allows us to guarantee a much higher quality of consistency and product. We measure our UniQs by generation these days. So we first uh, invented the UniQ concept in 1989. And in essence, it's quite a simple idea that I think most of you may be familiar with, but if you're not, the idea is that it's much, now if we take a musical instrument or a voice or something like that, we have a, a, a single source of sound which isn't split up into different parts. So in a loudspeaker, why, should, why would we do that? If we're trying to represent natural performance or trying to make something which is very convincing, it doesn't make sense to us to have a tweeter and then a separate mid-range with those two radiating from different points. So 1988 was quite a significant year because much better magnet technology became available, neodymium magnets. And that meant the, the engineering team at KEF could miniaturize the motor on the tweeter so that it's small enough to go into the mid-range cone and actually sit at the apex of the cone, right back at the throat. That has a great effect that you can design these two drivers now so that they radiate sound from the same point in space, but also so they've got very consistent directivity. So the way they throw the sound towards you is, is very consistent. And, and that represents something of an ideal in terms of a loudspeaker. And 
So that, then you have a speaker where the entire vocal range, at least, um, is coming from a single point in space. And it gives you a character to the speaker, which is impossible to get if you don't have technology like that. We've got many patents now that cover specifics of how you make a UniQ work really well. So this is what we call a Generation 12 UniQ, which is bringing it up to the most recent technology level from the previous ones in the reference and blade, which were Generation 11. But as soon as you try and put two drivers so they're so intimately located, now there's a lot you have to think about um, in terms of positioning things, how things are going to affect uh, one driver is going to affect the other. So it's quite a uh, design challenge. One thing that's absolutely critical in a UniQ is getting the shape of that right so that it was going to launch a high frequency wave that travels down the mid-range cone and reaches the listener without being disturbed. So what you can notice here is if we take the surface there from the small waveguide around the tweeter onto the mid-range cone and then over the surround, everything is entirely smooth, I'm trying to avoid anything that's going to disrupt that um, tweeter performance. And actually, if you look in the products, that surface then continues smoothly onto the shadow flare in the case of reference or if you look in Blade, into the whole cabinet. In front of the tweeter, we have uh, a, what we call the tangerine waveguide. These fins on here, they help to guide the sound into the cone, uh, and they also help us to get a bit more efficiency out the top end of the UniQ, uh, and give us a little bit wider dispersion too. But what you can see that's quite unique um, in our UniQs of kind of 12th generation and with Matt is actually in the middle behind the tweeter, there's a huge amount of space that we leave. So that the sound from the back of the tweeter is not really impeded at all. It can go straight down this duct and hit the absorber at the back. But you can see how much effort we have to make in the UniQ to design things around the absorber and catching the rear wave off the tweeter really, really effectively. Outside of that, we have this whole section here, which is the motor systems for the two units. And we'll go into that in a bit more detail as we go through the slides. Um, and then, of course, you know, some of the things that can't be overlooked are the suspension of the surround that hold the parts, but they have to allow them to move so that they can radiate sound. And exactly how you design them has a really big effect on the performance too. So when that driver's replaying music, you're generating a force which is pushing on the cones, causing them to move, and that's how you hear sound. But it also generates a reaction force, which vibrates. And when you're aiming for very, very high performance, how you control that reaction force becomes very important. We don't want that reaction force to shake the cabinet, cause uh, some other radiation, some panel movement that is going to disturb what you're hearing. Decoupling is something that Kef um, invented, I think, in the 1970s. And that's the idea that rather than bolting that rigidly into your cabinet, you put it on some resilient mounts. So if that's got some vibrations shaking around, try and avoid it being passed into the cabinet. But we stopped doing that in uh, these ranges of speakers. Um, we instead made a very, very rigid chassis um, for the, sorry, I'm talking about the 2014 reference series and the 2011 blade. So we made a very rigid chassis and we made the box as strong as we possibly could. And the reason for that is that conventionally when you decouple like this with some resilient mounts under the unit, what you do is you do avoid the vibration going into the box, but you actually make the driver move a lot more. And then you can get quite a lot of radiation that you don't want off the rim of the driver. And we know from experience of having done this for the 20 previous years that it's actually very difficult to control the stiffness of those resilient mounts in production. So if you make 20 speakers, you'll find some are really tuned nicely and some not so, not so well. So this is a problem we wanted to try and uh, tackle differently. It led us to do something a little bit radical. So with the chassis of the driver, you'd normally conventionally make that as rigid as you possibly can. But what we realized was actually, we, if we make a kind of paradigm shift and say, well, let's try and build in the decoupling into the chassis, then you can get something where we can control that a lot better. We can uh, optimize the shape of the chassis to give us just the right level of resilience that we want. We can use multiple materials as well. And we don't have to particularly worry, well, we don't have to worry at all about if that's going to affect the ceiling of the driver. 
I bought this with me because you can see it on the screen, but it's much easier to see it in person. So we have a kind of leaf suspension arrangement on the chassis here, and then damping underneath the chassis. And you can see if you push it, it will move backwards and forwards, just like a suspension in a car. Schematically, that's what we're trying to do. So putting the resilient mount back here, so that we avoid the vibration transfer even into the chassis now. And um, we always like to be quite rigorous when we're doing things like this. We have a nice tool in Maidstone, which is a, a laser that will measure surface velocity of our cabinets. And here's an example of the kind of changes of uh, just one of the panels at a point, how much vibration we're getting. So the reds representing the 2014 reference, what we had before with the rigid chassis and lots of bracing. Uh, the blue here is this arrangement, but with the damping missing, and then the green, the final result. So you can see a you know, very big reduction in, in the, the worst frequency there. Moving on now to the uh, metamaterial absorber. One of the things that a lot of manufacturers are aware of is that the sound that comes off the back of the drivers is very important. If you want to get really, really high quality sound, you need to be able to control that. So this is a little bit of a simplified view, but you imagine if the tweet is moving and producing treble, sound comes off the front and that's what you will hear. The sound also comes off the back. Um, and we have to deal with that. We have to enclose that somehow. The polarity is reversed on the sound that comes off the back, so we can't let it escape for you to hear it because it would interfere with the sound at the front. Um, but also you have a lot of parts around here which make it quite difficult to fit a big cavity in there or to fill you know, a big cavity with lots of wadding. So lots of manufacturers are looking at you know, how to do this better. Alongside that, there's a whole kind of area of study in lots of other industries looking at things called metamaterials. So this is kind of a fancy word for the idea that you can, with modern computer simulation and CAD, you can generate much more complicated geometries that interact with light or sound in, in quite complicated ways, and you can tune them to do specific jobs. Um, and we um, partnered up with a technology company that was linked to a university in Hong Kong who were making absorbers um, for controlling industrial noise. And they had a particular technology that we thought was really, really cool. So it was a, a type of sound absorber that used lots and lots of narrow channels, all of different lengths, all optimized, and then they would fold them up so that they occupied a small amount of space. We uh, talked to them, we understood their technology, we worked with them, we then adapted it so that we could use it behind a tweeter and we had to rearrange things. Um, and the benefit of this is that we can get much more sound absorption at the bottom end of the tweeter's range than you can if you just try and put wadding into a tube. And we thought it would have a big, a big difference but the proof is always in the pudding. So for the um, you know, vast majority of that project, we were working you know, on the computer, on simulations and things. And it was only in the last portion where we got prototypes into drivers and really understood how much of a benefit that could be. I have a couple of these here that you can take a look at. But what they have inside there is 30 channels. Um, they're all optimized in length. And each channel absorbs a portion of the sound from the tweeter. And when you combine them all together, you can get something that absorbs the uh, broadband spectrum from the tweeter from 600 hertz upwards. Um, the longest channel is around about 25 centimeters. Um, the shortest is only about half a centimeter. Um, so if you, if you put them all out straight, it looked a bit like pan pipes. And, uh, but to fit it effectively into the driver, we fold it up into, into this disc. Uh, the motor system is, is absolutely critical. That's the bit that changes the electrical signal from the amplifier into the force that drives the cone. And that's probably the major you know, part where you can introduce um, distortion of some kind, 
And, and so it defines uh, the fidelity to quite a high degree. It's how, how pure can you make that transfer? Can you get the force applied to the coil to be very, very close to the, the voltage that's coming out the amplifier? One of the things we can do to improve that is to make things more powerful. So if we can generate a bigger force for the same signal, that really helps to minimize things like distortion uh, from the uh, magnetic field in the coil because the current's not as high and heating of the coil. Um, and it generally just makes everything a lot easier. So the first starting point is you know, for the design of the mid-range in particular, using a lot of magnetic material. The whole of the outer portion here is, is a big neodymium magnet. and So the, the drivers ended up at the back there, but you can have a look when that comes back uh, at just the quantity of neodymium that's in there. The next part of it is to make sure that when the coil's moved, so say you're playing music, the coil's going to be moving constantly, so that we don't get any change in how strong the motor is when the coil's in different places. And, and that's a fairly tricky area. So what you have to come up with is an arrangement where, you see here's the coil in here, that when the coil moves, the amount of uh, strength the motor has is constant. And we've done something a little bit unusual here where we have a gap in our motor system. So what you can see here is here's the outside of the driver and here's the tube that goes to the tweeter. The voice coil is in here. And we've split this magnetic circuit into two halves with a gap between them. So when you look at the magnetic field that's around the coil, it's actually got a dip in it. That gives us an interesting opportunity then to control how wide we make this gap and how deep that dip is. And what we found is that we can use that to make the magnetic, uh, the strength of the motor more constant as the coil's moving backwards and forwards. So it gives us an extra parameter we can optimize. There's another really nice byproduct to it, which is we can put something in that gap. So what we've put in that gap is a big piece of copper. And that's very important because one of the major sources of distortion is from the magnetic field that comes from the voice coil. So you're passing the signal into it, it generates its own magnetic field. And the way that interacts with the steel in the motor, that generates a lot of distortion. What happens when you put a piece of conductive material near it, you change it into something that's a little bit like a transformer. So whatever current we have in the voice coil, we end up with a current in the opposite direction in this piece of copper. And they, the two magnetic fields cancel out to some extent. That reduces the amount of modulation of the magnetic field. So it's kind of a, a double whammy. We've got this arrangement which allows us to optimize the strength of the motor system so it's more constant, and it gives us space to put this huge piece of copper right next to the mid-range driver. When you're refining a driver to this degree, you start to find tiny details make quite a big difference. Um, so Unicune has started off in 89 as a relatively simple idea. Let's miniaturize a tweeter and put it in a mid-range driver. And I think it's fair to say it's taken pretty much the entire you know, 30 years since for us to get a handle on all the interactions. And one of the subtlest ones is the sound coming from the tweeter, a little bit of it disappears into the gap. So if you, if you look at the driver, you'll see around the outside of the tweeter, and the sound can go down that gap. It's only a tiny gap, but some sound goes down. And uh, we've realized that, you know, if you don't pay attention to what's going on there, that sound can bounce around and come back out a moment later. And it gives um, you know, a, a quality to the treble which isn't particularly nice. So these days in all our UniQ since the R series in 2018, we have a little sound absorber down that gap. That we, we try and design to catch um, that little portion that goes down. The thing that's always tricky is that we're also trying to fit a lot of other things into the driver. And so various different Uniqs, we've put this absorber in different positions. So you know, the main challenge there was finding a place to put it. The surround is also quite a tricky one because it, although it looks small, it's significant area uh, in terms of the driver. So it does radiate sound. So we need to look at that as something which is a flexible thing supporting the cone, but also something that's going to radiate sound itself. And, and that's quite a tricky area uh, in terms of design and analysis. You have to anal analyze it from a few 
different perspectives. So there's been a lot of work on those to tidy up their performance and also look at how we can make them work better from kind of two different perspectives, saying, well, how does this work as a resilient thing that's holding the cone and as a radiator? So the, the kind of bottom line of that is that we end up with something where we get much um, more consistent output from the driver. So that, that's actually two simulation results of uh, the R-Series 2014 in green and the FEA of the new driver in red there. So just you can just see some of the, the kinks and wiggles which are uh, smoothed out, and that's mostly down to the refinement of the surround and suspension. The crossovers always will need to be changed if we change the driver. Even if we ch change a very simple thing on the driver, we would redo the crossovers. But this is a fairly major change on the driver. And so we started really from scratch. So even though we, you know, we haven't changed the LF drivers, for example, we still redid the LF crossover. And there's certainly a lot of engineering. You know, we do simulation software to predict what the crossover is going to do. We measure the output of the speaker on a, a spherical array of microphones. But the key is then saying, well, how is that going to sound, listening to it and understanding you know, if you hear something you don't like, how, how can you change it in the crossover? One of the things that we were really happy with is that on Blade, we'd realized for some, for some prototyping work about three years ago that it would be a big advantage if we could have a slightly lower crossover on the mid-range. It would give us better product dispersion. And so one of the key things of the new UniQ is it can work a bit lower than the old one. It can move a bit further than mid-range. And, and the result is that we could change the crossover approach. These figures are a little bit abstract, but you've basically got angle here around to the back of the speaker, and then the color tells you the sound output. So low frequencies, mid frequencies, high frequencies, and there's the transition between the bass section and the mid-range. And you can see the big change in that portion. So this whole area where we had some untidiness, is much, much better controlled. And the effect on the sound you know, is, is pretty big from that change. So, Okay, well, I'll be around for a little bit longer. So if anybody's got any other questions that come up, just come and grab me. So. I'll be glad, yeah? <laughs>